Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Sorry for the late start. Technical difficulties. Uh, the name of the game for today is we're going to learn about standing waves, and then I want to try and uh, leave plenty of time for you guys to um, do homework, right? Uh, we've got, let's see, homework is due this Saturday, and then uh, we have an exam next week, right? So that means that the chapter 17 stuff, which I'm starting today, is due uh, next Wednesday. Right, so we can get chapter 16 mostly done. That leaves this Friday for some chapter 16 and a lot of chapter 17 in grasp. Then we will be right on track. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a special kind of wave um, today. So, so up to this point, we've been talking about traveling waves, waves that go places. They have velocity, wavelength, frequency. And before we can talk about standing waves that literally just stand there, uh, we do need to talk about how waves reflect and bounce around so that we can start overlapping those waves in time and space. Let me adjust this really quick so that things don't cut off. Boy, so many technical details this morning. All right, so what I'm going to do, play a video for you, and uh, they're going to use a, in this video, they're going to use a special machine, okay, a uh, wave machine to try to show you what's going on with reflection of waves. We'll send a torsional wave down this wave machine to show what happens when the wave reaches the end. When the rod at the end is free to move, the wave reflects back with the same positive amplitude as the incoming wave. So it was up, right? It's up, 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 gets to the end, bounces back, and is still up, right? If we fasten the last rod on the machine so it can't move, the reflected wave has an amplitude opposite that of the incoming wave. So it's up, 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 hits the boundary, boom, right? and inverts itself. So the rules for reflections of wave, anytime a wave bounces off something, so anytime my voice, right, bounces off the walls in this room, those walls are like the end of that machine where it was fastened down. And so any reflection coming off of those walls is gonna be a wave that's upside down from the way that it went in. So any peak becomes a trough, any trough becomes a peak. Did you catch the rules there, though? What happens when a wave hits a, a, the end and it's free to move? Yeah, there's no inversion, okay? We call it a phase change in physics, but the, the wave maintains its orientation. But when it hits a solid boundary, that's when it will invert. That's true for waves on strings, like on musical instruments. Uh, it's true for like woodwind instruments. If the, if the air is trying to vibrate up against anything that uh, physically stops the air from vibrating. But if the air is free to move, the air molecules are free to move, they will go through. Uh, yeah. So those are the rules for reflection of waves. There are, we'll go over them in a second, but there are certain things that only waves can do, and this is one of them. This is one of the key ways that we know something is a wave versus if it's a particle. Wave superposition means that waves can be at the same place at the same time as another wave. They, they can overlap in space and time. When particles try to do this, there's trouble. Anybody that's ever tried to open a door and has missed the handle and has tried to be at the same place at the same time as a door knows full well that particles can't be at the same place at the same time. But waves traveling towards each other can actually overlap and take up the same place at the same time and remain unaffected by that overlap. So here's a couple of, and, and we have to do this with pictures because it can happen really fast with waves. It would be difficult to see. But you can see here that we've got two pulses, right? One of them's a little bit smaller than the other. And as they come together, we always add the amplitudes of those wave pulses. Now, we're about to show you what happens when one's underneath, but we're summing them together, right? So 
let's say the big one has got twice the amplitude of the small one, right? Their combination would be three times the amplitude, right? Two plus three. But here's the key. After they have interacted, after they pass through and are at the same place at the same time as each other, they continue on as if nothing happened, right? This is, what, this is something that only waves can do. We cannot do this with particles. <clears throat> and we would call, when these overlap and superimpose on each other, we call this interference. And when there is any kind of like um, uh, making the amplitude bigger, the sum of the two amplitudes is bigger than any of the originals, we call that constructive interference. We're building it up, we're making it bigger. Contrast that with very similar situation here, only we've got one of the pulses that is inverted. It's a, instead of being a peak, it's a trough. When they come together at the same place at the same time, we still add them together. It's just we're adding a, like a negative amplitude here, right? And so the overall result is smaller than it would be otherwise. We call that destructive interference. So, so interference or superpositions of waves, those two words are used interchangeably. And then we have the constructive case where things add together, get bigger. And then we have the destructive case where they're canceling each other out in some way, shape, or form. Now, if both of these pulses were exactly the same amplitude, what would the sum look like here? It would look like zero, okay? And that's exactly, we can cancel these out. If any of you have, have or have ever worn noise-canceling headphones that aren't just blocking out sound, but like are actively noise-canceling them, you turn them on the mode and everything kind of goes quiet and it feels like there's pressure on your ears, your headphones are receiving sound, inverting that sound, and sending it into your ear along with the original sound. And it cancels it out. And then they can do all kinds of fancy tricks where they like tune it so that human voices can come through, but the traffic doesn't pull it out. So that's a, that's a type of application of, of interference. Okay, so there are four phenomena that we associate with waves, but two of these phenomena can be faked by particles. And the way I remember this is, is that the two, the, the two that start with the letter R, the two that start with the same letter, those are the ones that particles can do also. So if I take a, if I take a particle like my tennis ball over here, right? Okay. This is definitely not a wave. It's a particle. It has specific location in space and time, right? And I throw it into the wall, right? It will reflect right off the wall, right? So particles can do reflection, no problem. Refraction is the bending of a wave or a particle. It's a change in the, in the trajectory because the medium that the thing is changing has changed. If I try to throw my tennis ball, say, into a pool, okay, it, when it hits the water, it's not going to follow the same line that it did that I threw it at. It'll either skip off, which is a reflection, or if it goes into the water, it'll change the direction it's going. That's because its speed changes. Waves do the same thing. We get to physics 2B, you'll talk about refraction of light waves. If you've ever sat uh, on the edge of a pool and had your legs dangling in there and your legs look all funny and short and stubby, you've been, you've been seeing refraction of light waves. The bending of a wave, bending of a particle when the medium is changing. So the two that start with R, particles and waves can both do those things. However, the other two... Those are things that only waves can do. If you're seeing interference phenomena, where you're seeing constructive and destructive interference, particles can't do that. If two particles try to be at the same place at the same time as each other, they'll just bounce off of each other and they'll never overlap. Waves can overlap. And so if you see something overlapping in time and space and then continuing on as if unaffected, that's a wave. Diffraction is a phenomenon where waves will bend around obstacles. And again, you'll, you'll learn more about this in Physics 2B when we're talking about light waves because there's, there's more um, examples there of diffraction. But sound waves do diffract also. The, the car alarms out here in this parking lot, if you're on the north side over by the theater, you can hear all the car alarms going off in the parking lot. 
because the sound diffracts or bends over the building rather than just being completely blocked by it. But again, these two definite waves. No question, interference and diffraction going on, you know it's a wave. If it's reflection or refraction, it could be a particle that is doing it. Okay, so with, with reflection rules in mind and knowing about wave superposition, uh, I can now show you a standing wave and where it comes from and all that kind of stuff. But due to my technical difficulty, I didn't have time to get this completely set up, so let me... I gotta make it so that you guys can see the wave that's happening here. So let's see if I can pull this off. This is gonna be exciting because I haven't tested it yet this morning. It's kind of hard to see a white string on a white background. So let's see here. Let's do this. Isn't this so exciting watching a business professor set something up? All right. I wonder where the stuff we get from the physics department has been. Let's do this. Okay. Let's see. This is going to work right here. I can get it to not interfere with anything. There might be enough contrast. Can you guys see the the white screen there? Maybe a little bit. You guys see it? Can you guys see that? Okay. Now I can. <laughs> okay. Here we go. So what I've got here, okay, I've got a mechanical oscillator, okay, and the mechanical oscillator is attached to something that is going to generate sine functions. It's going to wiggle this oscillator back and forth, and I can change how much this oscillator, how fast it goes back and forth. I can change its amplitude, all, all kinds of stuff. So, so what it's going to do is it's going to send a, a wave pulse, okay. It's going to send a peak, okay. And it's going to the wave. It's going to, and it's going to send another one. So it's causing a wave to go up this string. Okay, and then it hits that boundary up there, which is a solid boundary. What happens at solid boundaries to waves? Inverse. They invert, right? They come back backwards, and so it's going to. So that pulse is going to invert and come back down, while simultaneously another pulse is coming up, right? And so I should get overlapping of different kinds of, you know, I've got uh, pulses that will be upright and some that will be inverted and they all come back. And if I get this tuned just right, I can get a big bounce on my string. Now, uh, can you see that a little bit right there? Okay, right? This is called the fundamental. Don't worry, I'm going to give you a chance. We're going to write all this stuff down, okay? But I'm just going to turn up the frequency here. Got to tune it just right. Something happened. Yeah, there's two now, isn't there? Right, I had one, now I have two. Increase the frequency some more. Oh. Oh, now what do you see? There's three. Okay. I'm going to make up some numbers now, but let's say that that fundamental that I had, just the, just the one, right, that was on the string, let's say that that was at 10 hertz. Well, at two of these patterns, I was at 20 hertz. Now I'm at 30 hertz. Any guesses as to where the next pattern is going to be? 40? So we'll increase the amp. Oh, oh. oh wait, uh-oh. One, two, three, four. Oh, I got five. I missed. <laughs> I missed. I missed four. Let's see if I can bring it back to four. So if I don't hit the right frequency, it kind of just all falls apart, doesn't it? Ah, oh, there it is. Can you see the four? Right? Okay, so a lot of stuff going on here. Let me, let me go to five. Yeah. 
you hear the resonance in the table? Okay, so there's a really strong five right there, okay? And I call it five because one, two, three, four, five of these football shape type things, right? Okay, take a look at like what's happening to the string like right here and right here and right here and up here. What kind of interference do you think that is? Destructive. It's destructive, right? It's like the spot, the perfect spot where a pulse that was going up hits another pulse that was coming down and I've tuned it just right to cancel it out right there. In the language of standing waves, we call this a node. The opposite of a node, it's called an anti-node. So this standing wave pattern consists of one, two, three, four, five anti-nodes. Okay? For standing waves on a string, we're only doing standing waves on a string today. Uh, we'll do standing waves in pipes, which are musical instruments. We'll do that tomorrow. Uh, for standing waves on a string, you ignore the number of nodes and you just count the number of anti-nodes. And that will tell you which harmonic you're on for that standing wave. And we use that term very deliberately in physics. Those of you that have studied music or know a little bit about music might understand what a harmony is, where there's a, a pleasing sound between two different musical notes. Okay? There's a mathematical relationship that exists between the frequencies of those notes. Well, let's come back down. Again, if I don't get it, so, so nothing's really happening here, right? It's just sort of wiggling. I'm not getting that standing wave pattern. I do have to get the frequency just right in order to get my standing wave pattern. How many anti-nodes are there on this string right now? Just one, okay? There's only one anti-node right there, okay? And so I call it my fundamental or first harmonic of my standing wave, okay? One anti-node, first harmonic, also called the fundamental. Okay, and then I increase my frequency, it kind of falls apart, and I keep increasing it, keep increasing it, keep increasing it until, whoop, I get the frequency just, oh, see, I missed it, I went too far. I gotta get the frequency just right, gotta tune it just right to get my, how much, what, what is this harmonic now? Two. Two, so how do you know which harmonic you're on? Count the, count the number of anti-nodes, right? Okay, nice and straightforward, okay? Two anti-nodes, this has to be my second harmonic. I do have a node right here, but I've got two anti-nodes there. Okay, so increase the frequency again. I got three. Okay, I'm just gonna like totally up the frequency here, see what I get. One, two, three, four, oh, there's five. You know, oof. Okay, what are we on right now? One, two, three, four, five, seven. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I wanna to prove to you that this is actually a wave, okay? Now, it's got kind of wave-like things, right? There's a frequency here. We've got what looks like maybe peak and trough at the same time, and then we got an equilibrium and peak and trough. But what I wanna do is I wanna to prove to you that there is actually a wave that is traveling up this string and coming back down. I want you to see that like right here, if this were a peak, then the one right next door is going to be a trough. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna go back to the 1970s, okay? And we're gonna, we're gonna whip out some disco in the form of a strobe light, okay? Now, if you are sensitive to flashing lights, okay, if that triggers anything in you, you're, you're gonna to wanna to close your eyes until I tell you to open them, okay? Because I do need to do a strobe light on this string. But what I wanna do is I wanna trick your eyes into seeing, okay? I wanna freeze the motion of this string in, in time and, and, and trick your eyeballs into thinking that there's no standing wave here. So I'm gonna turn the lights off. I think I can leave that screen on. Oh, let's turn that one off too. More exciting if I possibly die. 
Oh, it's so dark. Mr. Bailey, this is how I always feel with physics class. All right, where is it? Okay, so here comes the flashing light. So if I adjust the frequency, can I get a higher frequency? Yeah, I can, okay. If I adjust the frequency of my strobe light, okay, I can freeze, there it is. I can freeze this string in place, okay? Now, if you have closed your eyes because of the flashing lights, it's probably safe to open them right now, because I got it at a pretty high frequency, but I don't know if you can see, but right here, it's pointing this way, and then right next door, it's pointing the opposite direction, right? So this is very definitely a wave, right? Going up and down the string. It's just that when we see it all together, we see the nodes and the anti-nodes. All right, I'm gonna adjust this a little bit more so it's gonna flash a bit, but I just wanna show you some tricks that you can do. Oh, there's three of them. Is everybody able to see that? All right? And I can get like two. Again, I'm, I'm playing tricks with your eyes and how they work. Flashing the light at exactly the right frequency to let you see what's going on. I can go like, Wah! Like seriously, who needs drugs? <laughs> Physics is my drug. All right? All kinds of fun things you can do with that. All right, let me turn the lights back on. Okay. But as you can see, right, when we can see it happening without that, that synchronized flash, this, this string essentially is what it's doing is it's, it's bouncing back and forth. Well, it's actually going around. Don't worry about that. It's bouncing back and forth. Okay. And as it bounces back and forth, I can flash the light so that the light flashes when it's over here. And then there's no flash, no flash, no flash, no flash until it gets back to here. Right, and then it flashes again, and our eyes will see only when the string is illuminated. But what I wanted you to see there, right, is that the that when this one's a peak, this one's a trough, right? Back and forth, back and forth. So it is made up of waves. But when they all come together like this, when we have our overlaps of destructive and con constructive interference going on. We swap out the terminology and we say, okay, this is an anti-node, a place where there's maximum displacement going on the wave, and this is my node right here, okay? a place where the, where the string, I, like literally, is just not moving in that spot, okay? It, it's, just, it's just stuck there. All right, so that is what a standing wave is. And... Just in case my <laughs> demonstration wasn't working, uh, I did bring another picture there. Okay, so um, let's, let's try to get a toolbox going, okay, for how standing waves function um, and, and how we can sort of um, calculate our way through them, figuring out things like wavelength and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to start with a length of string. It doesn't matter what the length is, okay? It's just a set length. And uh, it could be one, let's just pretend it's one meter because I know you guys like numbers. Let's say we got a one meter piece of string, okay? And we put the fundamental pattern, the fundamental standing wave pattern on this string. We know it's got one anti-node, okay, again, Nodes at both ends, because this technically are this the, the two edges, the boundary conditions here are that the string is not allowed to wiggle at either end, right? So that would by definition be nodes. But we're going to count the number of anti-nodes in this system. Since it has one anti-node, we're going to call it the first harmonic, and we're going to use the lowercase n as a integer counting number. Right? So if n equals 3, we're on the third harmonic. If n equals 10, we're on the 10th harmonic, so on and so forth. And how do you know which harmonic you're on? Number of antinodes. Look at the wave. Boom. Okay. So the 10th harmonic is going to have 10 antinodes, so on and so forth. So we'll use the symbol n as our way to keep track of which harmonic 
we're actually on. Okay, so let's talk about wavelength. Um, what does a complete wave look like? Like a full period, a full cycle of any wave. What does it, what does it look like? Um, peak and there's, there's going to be a peak and a trough somewhere, right? I mean, I could do this with sine or cosine. Oh, sorry, guys. I can't see anything that I'm writing on this one. What? You can't see through the wonderful green boundary I put up? It's like my Roman battle standard or something. Okay. So, you probably still can't see it because it's so faint. But, right, there's going to be a peak and there's going to be a trough, right? That's what would be a complete wave. So, if I only have what amounts to as a peak, right? I kind of start here, go through a peak, and then come back to equilibrium. How much of a wavelength do I have on this standing wave? Half, right? Basically, I've only gone from node to anti-node back to node, right? And that's half of a complete wave. And that's what they're trying to say down here, right? And what they're trying to say is, look, the, the, for the, whatever the length of the string is, okay, I've got half my wavelength on there. So that if it was a one meter piece of string, what would the wavelength of the first harmonic be? Two, right? If half of the wavelength is on one meter piece of string, then I would need to double that to get a full wavelength, and double one meter is two meters. Okay. So now we go to the second. And don't worry, we're going we're gonna to write all this down in the toolbox, okay? Now I go to the second harmonic. How do I know it's the second harmonic? Two antinodes. Now, now notice how they've drawn this. Okay, right? If let me let me give you some hints, right, as to how to draw um, antinodes on your paper. Draw standing waves on your paper. Let's see. This pen a little bit, a little bit. Okay. So um, it can be really hard to try to. It's not very good, right? Okay. Um, to try to draw a standing wave pattern. Right? So this is what I suggest you do. Draw footballs. Like there's a football, right? And then just draw another football next to it. And then draw another football next to it, and then draw another football next to it, right? Like that seems to be an easier way. If you try to do like this, you, you end up with funny DNA or something, right, okay? So um, I, I just suggest that you try this, right? Just just draw anti-nodes. I've, I've seen students go so far as to uh, forget footballs, Mr. Baylor, I'm just gonna draw surf. I'm uh, fine, right, okay? Whatever can help you visualize going on, but basically we just need the number of anti-nodes, right, okay? So just a little hint for recording that in there. But notice, notice on this picture, right? We've got node, anti-node, node. And then the next anti-node is the opposite. If one's a peak, one's a trough, because I showed you that on the screen, right? That two adjacent anti-nodes are opposites of each other. How much of a wavelength is now on my string? It's one complete wavelength, right? Because I have a peak and I have a trough. Before, on the first one, right, all I had was one peak. That's half of a wavelength. Now at the second harmonic, I've got a peak and a trough, which is a full wavelength. And so if this string is one meter long, what's the wavelength of the second harmonic? One meter, right? Because a full complete rocket. Okay. So now we go to the third harmonic. How many antinodes will there be? There'll be three. We know those trace, we got them. Okay. How many wavelengths are here now? There's one and a half, right? We seem to be picking up like a half every time, have you noticed? What was the L equation for the last one? Sorry. Equals lambda. Yeah. Okay. So, and again, I'm going to summarize all these L equations. You don't really need to write any of these down, okay? Because we're going to give you the whole enchilada. But this thing, right, is one and a half wavelength. So if this string is one meter long, this is a little bit tricky, 
If this string is one meter long, what is the wavelength of the third harmonic? It's two thirds of a meter. Because we got one third for half, another third for the second half, that's two thirds of this string. Right? So, what I'm trying to show you here is that there is a mathematical pattern to how the harmonics and the wavelengths of these strings are coming out. And we want to tie this into frequency. So let's, let's finally give you the toolbox for navigating standing waves, and I should say, on a string. Okay? Because we'll, we'll have slightly different rules for standing waves in air when we get there tomorrow. First of all, uh, I should probably, we should probably write down that the speed of a wave on a string depends entirely on that string. Now, I talked about this yesterday. The properties of the medium determine the speed of the wave. And so tension and how heavy the string is, that mu down there, right, that's mass per unit length, that's going to tell us what the speed of a wave is. So we'll, we'll have that equation here for completeness. Now, the fundamental, uh, let me write down the equations and then let me explain to you what they're trying to tell you. Because we actually, instead of writing them down in terms of wavelength, we write them down in terms of frequency. The frequency of the nth harmonic is going to be equal to whatever that harmonic number is times the fundamental frequency of our standing wave. When I was doing my standing wave on a string over here, uh, I said that my fundamental was at 10 hertz. And when we went to the second harmonic, it was 20 hertz. And when we went to the third harmonic, it was 30 hertz. Can you tell me what the fifth harmonic's frequency is going to be? It's going to be 50 hertz. You just take your harmonic number, the number of antinodes, and multiply by your fundamental frequency. And boom, you know what the frequency of your fifth harmonic is going to be. The fundamental frequency is going to be V over twice the length. of the string. The wavelength, the fundamental wavelength, I don't remember if you remember what it was, right? But we had half of that, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. The screen said L was equal to one half of the fundamental wavelength, and then we managed to fit just the wavelength on there. And then for the third one, it was one and a half wavelengths. Can you see the pattern there? What's, what's changing on each one of these? We start with the base of a half, don't we? And then what? What, have we, what number have we multiplied by to just get to lambda now? One half becoming a one means a two over a two. And for the third one, it's three over two. What's the fourth one going to be? Four over two or two. What's the fifth one going to be? But this mathematical relationship is the very fundamental basis of what we call music. And we're going to get there. Tomorrow we're going to get to um, creating musical sound and all that stuff. Okay. So what's going on here? That means that my wavelength, like if I, if I rearrange this top equation, my first wavelength is twice the length of my string, right? And the second one is just going to be the length of my string, and the third one is going to be two-thirds the length of my string. So basically, my nth wavelength, okay? is going to be 2L over N. Let's see if that pattern holds, right? So 2L over 1 is 
2L, right? What's 2L over 2? 1 or L. What's 2L over 3? 2 thirds L. 2L over 4 would be half the length of the string. So it looks like we also want to write this one down. The way that you, of course, get between this equation for frequency and our derived equation for wavelength is V equals lambda F, right? And so you can do this, that, that's where this one comes from. These two things are saying the same thing. It's just one is in terms of frequency, one is in terms of wavelength. I should have drawn this one. Move you, cut and paste up to there. Okay, so the two middle boxes, right, will tell you any harmonic. Any harmonic you want. Fifteenth? Seventh? A harmonic is always going to be an integer value. You're never going to get a harmonic of, say, one and a half or 1.4 or any of that kind of stuff. Okay? You, you can only have integer numbers for n. n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 60 billion, whatever. Okay? But it can, it can only be that integer. Um, your fundamental frequency is going to be your wave speed divided by twice the length. Your fundamental wavelength, if you care about it, don't usually use it, okay, is going to be twice the length of the string. That's the toolbox. Now, I would submit that none of the toolbox equations here are all that difficult. It, it, I mean, it's, it's fairly straightforward math to rearrange and do stuff with them. Um, the difficulty in standing waves, of course, comes from the concept behind it and making sure that you are oriented, right, and understand which harmonic you're dealing with and how to get back to fundamentals and that sort of thing. So let's do an example of working our way through that. Okay? So let's see here. Um, I'm reading the problem and they're telling me a lot of stuff, right? But what's the 1.2 M? What does that have to be? That's got to be a length, right? It's measured in meters. That's a length. So I'm going to make sure that I Kind of write down, okay, I know that my length is 1.2 meters. Um, four antinodes. What harmonic are we on? Fourth one, what symbol do we use to keep track of that? N. So N equals four. And when there are four antinodes, and I can go ahead and I can draw four footballs now. Two, three, four, just to, I mean, you know, just to give myself an anchor, a visual anchor to what's going on here. Sometimes I draw the walls. All right. Um, now, this pattern with four antinodes has a frequency of 120 hertz. What this means is the fourth harmonics frequency, F sub 4, is 120 hertz. Okay. Now they want us to find the fundamental frequency and the speed. From the toolbox, do we have any relationship between the fundamental and its harmonics? The very first one, it was that whatever harmonic you're on is equal to that harmonic times the fundamental, right? So, if we're on the fourth harmonic, that's four times the fundamental, isn't it? So how do I find the fundamental? I divide by my harmonic number, right? I take whatever frequency I have for that harmonic, and I divide by the harmonic number. So in this case, I have 120 hertz divided by four, so the fundamental frequency is going to be 30 hertz. Now they want me to find the speed of these waves. I could do this several different ways, right? Speed is equal to the square root of tension over mu, but they, they're not talking about tension or mass per unit length here, so that's not going to help. Um, 
I could find it since V equals lambda F for all waves, standing or otherwise. Could use that, but I don't know the wavelength. I could calculate it, it wouldn't be that hard. Um, but there's also a relationship between the fundamental and the speed and the length of the string. Remember the fundamental is equal to V over 2L. So I can rearrange this to find my speed. That's going to be the fundamental times twice the length of the string. So that's going to be 30 times 2 times 1.2, which I've now done this whole lecture without my notes. So I don't have them in front of me. Uh, 30 times 2 is 60, right? 1.2, 72. 72 watts. I'm solving for a speed and I've used all SI units. So what should I get? Meters per second. The magic of SI units. Okay. So there we go. Uh, I mean, if we wanted to find the wavelength of the fourth one, okay, that would be 2L over 4. We just plug that in and go. Um, we can find out all kinds of information. I do want to point out, you'll see me write this every once in a while that the nth harmonic is nv over 2l. What did I just do? We have this relationship right there, don't we? And we know the fundamental frequency is this. What happens if you shove these two equations together? You get nv over 2l, right? So a lot of times I'll save space by just writing nv over 2l and then if I'm on my fundamental I just put a 1 in there right I'm on my fourth sixth eighth tenth third whatever I just put the 3 in there for that particular thing I think what I want to do is stop there right I know you guys aren't used to, to 50 minutes just 50 minutes of physics but um, I want to stop there and give you plenty of time to um, uh, get help on chapter 16 homework, try to get that out of the way so we can focus on chapter 17 homework. Um, that's going to be coming up um, over, I mean, technically 16's due on Saturday, but you really want to kind of get a jump on chapter 17's homework. So we'll stop her right.